52-year-old Fred Jablin watched with pride as his three children filed ahead of him into Temple Beth Ahaba's Friday evening service. The night, October 29th, 2004, was cloudy and cool, and in Richmond, the capital city of Virginia, the maples and oak trees were still decked out with red and gold fall foliage. Even in the twilight darkness, the autumn colors glowed around the synagogue, the oldest Jewish house of worship in the city of almost 200,000 residents. Just the sight of Beth Ahaba and the graceful columns that fronted the stone and brick building always made Fred feel better, a little less anxious and a little less worried. And every time he walked past the familiar plaque outside the temple and read the words, quote, What doth the Lord require of thee? Justice, mercy, humility. Fred reminded himself that those three qualities had already helped him get through the worst years of his life. And he believed now that those same three qualities, justice, mercy, humility, would help guide him and his son and two daughters into a happier future. As the Jablins took their usual seats and exchanged quiet greetings with friends and acquaintances, Fred did what he always did. He made a point of reflecting on just how important religion, community, friendship, and the support of his colleagues at work were to his life and his family. And the power of gratitude was just one of the very hard lessons Fred had learned during the last five years, when the cracks in his marriage of almost two decades had become too deep to patch up. As a well-known and highly regarded college professor who had been one of the early pioneers in the field of organizational communication, Fred had truly believed five years ago, back in 1999, that he and his ex-wife, Piper Roundtree, could work together to resolve their differences. But that was before he had found out about his wife's affair with a local doctor. And while that affair was the tipping point for Fred's decision to file for divorce the next year, in March of 2001, that affair had really just been the final betrayal in a series of events that still had the power to shock him, even now, two years after he and Piper had officially ended their marriage. As Fred settled into his seat and prepared for the Shabbat, the service that would celebrate God's creation of the world and mark the beginning of a 24-hour period of rest and reflection, he thought how close he had come to losing his job and to losing the trust and respect of his neighbors and co-workers. In the terrible lead-up to the divorce, Piper's behavior had become more and more erratic. The medications she was taking for depression and attention deficit disorder did not seem to be enough to stabilize her moods or decrease her sense of anxiety or discontent. But it wasn't until Piper began calling police and reporting that Fred was physically abusing her and accusing him of trying to drug her that Fred had finally understood just how broken their relationship really was. By then, they had already tried marriage counseling, and Piper had moved out of their family house several times to stay with her best friend in Richmond. But even then, somehow Piper and Fred had still managed to limp along, despite the difficulty Piper had in holding a job, despite the fact that she had a law degree, and her increasing unreliability in caring for the kids, even after she chose to stay at home rather than work outside of the house. But then came the afternoon four years ago when police arrived at the University of Richmond where Fred had a tenured teaching position. Earlier that day, Piper had gone to the Henrico County Magistrate's Office and sworn out an arrest warrant and restraining order against her husband. Of course, it hadn't always been that way. Back when Fred, an up-and-coming professor, and Piper, a student in her final year, met back in 1981 at the University of Texas in Austin, they seemed to have exactly nothing in common. And when Fred, who was eight years older than Piper, first met Piper through another professor, Fred did not even recognize her as one of the many students who had attended one of Fred's classes the year before. While 21-year-old Piper was one of five children from an old Texas family that had lived in Harlingen, a small town just 30 miles north of the Mexico border, 29-year-old Fred was one of two brothers who were born and raised in a mostly Jewish working-class neighborhood just 20 miles east of New York City. While Piper was hands down beautiful, with her dark hair and dark eyes and petite but athletic build, Fred was thin and balding and completely average looking, except for the intelligent eyes and the playful grin that clued people in to his wry and entertaining sense of humor. And their outlook on the world turned out to be just as different as their appearances. Fred was a great believer in rational thinking, 
and where he viewed the world in terms of black and white and took great comfort in set routines, Piper was a free spirit who loved to paint and who would, over time, fill the couple's house with adopted and rescued animals, from birds to a pet ferret. But two years after their first meeting, Fred and Piper were married, and over the next six years, Piper would eventually get her law degree, cycle in and out of two jobs, and then give birth to their oldest child, their daughter Jocelyn. Their son Paxton would arrive three years later, and their youngest, Callie, would arrive three years after that. And for a long time, it seemed like Fred and Piper's differences actually brought out the best in each of them. Fred became less rigid in his thinking, and Piper seemed to blossom in the light of Fred's affection and devotion to her and the children. But over time, the charm of their opposite personalities seemed to wear very thin. Fred was never a big fan of Piper's family and took to skipping Piper's family reunions. For her part, Piper didn't really connect with Fred's family either, and when his parents died, she opted not to go to either of their funerals. But when Fred got the job offer from the University of Richmond, which came with a $30,000 a year bump in pay, both Piper and Fred agreed that financially at least, the move from Texas to Virginia made all kinds of sense for their family. The extra money meant that Piper did not have to worry about working if she didn't want to, and she could hire a cleaning service to take care of the house, along with a nanny who could help with the kids. And at first, Fred was sure that the move had given all of them a fresh start. But by 1995, 12 years after they had gotten married, and just one year after their move from Texas to Virginia, Fred and Piper were seeing a marriage counselor. Piper was just not able to pass the Virginia bar exam. That's the test that would have allowed her to practice law in Virginia. And even though she had been reluctant to leave her close-knit family in Texas, Piper was not prepared for just how much she missed her mother and siblings. Particularly, her older sister Tina, who had always been available to help babysit the kids and to take Piper's side in any of the complaints Piper had about Fred. Prone to postpartum depression, the arrival of the Roundtree Jablin's third baby a year after the move to Virginia seemed to send Piper into a tailspin. But even therapy, both marriage counseling and private therapy with a psychiatrist, did not stop Piper from racking up nearly $52,000 in credit card debt any more than it would reverse the couple's slide into divorce a few years later. But still, nothing in those rocky years could have prepared Fred for that afternoon when Piper had orchestrated his arrest on that charge of domestic violence. Even now, sitting inside the place of worship he had returned to after the divorce, Fred could feel the shame and stunned surprise he felt as he left his office under police escort, hearing the whispers of students and seeing the shock on the faces of his colleagues. But maybe that was exactly what Fred had needed in order to accept that he and his children were probably better off without Piper. So, immediately after being released from the police station that day, Fred had obeyed the terms of the restraining order and kept his distance from Piper by moving into a motel not far from Richmond University, but he also wasted no time in hiring an attorney, and one month later, Fred appeared in juvenile court and argued successfully that the Roundtree Jablin children were not safe with Piper. And when the judge examined the evidence of Piper's erratic behavior, the times when she had simply forgotten to pick the children up from school or other activities, and the complete lack of evidence that Piper was a victim of domestic violence, the judge granted Fred temporary custody of Jocelyn, Paxton, and Callie. Until that moment, Fred had believed that the love he and Piper shared for their three kids might be enough of a foundation for them to have a civil divorce. Instead, the children became the battlefield for a bitter custody fight. In the end, the court had not believed any of Piper's charges of abuse, and when Fred had filed for divorce, he did so on the grounds that Piper had been unfaithful. He had cited Piper's affair with their oldest daughter's doctor, although it would turn out that there had been other men too, maybe even going back to the mid-1990s. And there was nothing quick or easy about how they reached a settlement. Piper had repeatedly asked for delays in the divorce proceedings until finally in 2002, almost a year to the date after Fred had filed for the divorce, when Piper did not show up for a hearing on finances and custody, the judge went ahead and made a final ruling without her. And that ruling would turn out to be absolutely devastating for the one-time stay-at-home mom. Because on all fronts, 
Piper would wind up losing. According to that judgment, Fred, whose money had been used to purchase their house in Texas and their house in Virginia, and whose retirement account was much larger than Piper's, would get nearly all the couple's property and liquid assets. But it was the judgment on custody that would completely sever the bond between the parents, because when Fred would eventually press for full legal and physical custody, the court sided with him. That meant that Piper would need to go through Fred to make any and all arrangements to visit their three kids. And as far as support payments went, citing Piper's potential as an attorney to out-earn Fred's own salary as a professor, the court also agreed that Fred no longer needed to pay Piper support money, and that going forward, it was Piper who would need to get a job and pay Fred $890 in child support every month. Fred had had no illusions that Piper would actually make those payments, at least not on a monthly basis. And he was right, Piper had tried twice to declare bankruptcy as a way of setting aside the whole divorce decree until a federal bankruptcy court actually prevented her from filing a third time. But Piper's new financial obligations did mean that in order to practice law, she would need to move 1,200 miles away back to Texas where she had passed that state's bar exam and could practice law. But even though Piper had been the loser in the battle over custody, she had found ways to strike back at Fred. And when it came to revenge, Piper had a lot of help from her sister Tina. And just thinking of Tina made Fred's body tense. Immediately following the court ruling on child support and custody, Tina had written a 43-page so-called psychological profile of Fred. A nurse practitioner who ran her own women's healthcare clinic, Tina was not a licensed mental health professional. But that did not stop her from attacking every aspect of Fred's character, personality, and temperament. In the report, Tina accused Fred of physical and sexual assault, drug abuse, and various personality disorders. She also warned parents that any child or minor that Fred had contact with was at risk of being psychologically abused. Describing the report as a, quote, court document, so it sounded very official, Piper then emailed her sister's denunciation of Fred to his co-workers and university administration as well as to members of the Parent Teachers Association at the schools the children all went to, and to the leaders of the scout clubs the kids attended, and to the list of friends and acquaintances Fred and Piper had once shared. During that especially dark period, when the divorce and the pain was so raw that Fred questioned if life could ever seem normal again, he had wondered who hated him more, his ex-wife Piper or his ex-sister-in-law Tina. Just the thought of that question made Fred doubly relieved that he had changed his will just this last year so that in the event of his death, custody of his kids, along with the control over the financial assets his kids would inherit, would go to his brother, Michael, who lived with his wife and their two kids in Northern Virginia. Fred had also installed a home security system just in case. He'd never forgotten the time when Piper had taken their youngest child and disappeared without telling Fred only to turn up in Texas at her sister Tina's with a story of how Fred had started trying to drug Piper. In fact, it had been the other way around. After Fred and Piper split, Fred had learned from a neighbor that Piper had confessed to spiking Fred's morning coffee with the antidepressant Prozac. Fred was suddenly brought back to the present by a gentle nudge from his 15-year-old daughter Jocelyn. And he realized with a start that he had spent the last several minutes just going through the motions of the Friday evening service. He thought again of the plaque outside the temple, that what the Lord asked of him was justice, mercy, and humility. Fred was self-aware enough to know that when he and Piper divorced two years ago, he was thinking more of justice than he was of mercy or humility. But now, two years after the divorce agreement was signed, it seemed like both he and Piper had reached a much better place both as a divorced couple and as individuals. It had taken Fred a while, but he had grown into his all-consuming role as single dad, and all three kids were doing exceptionally well. He loved taking the kids to their after-school and summer activities, they had become close to their uncle, Fred's brother Michael, and just five months earlier, Fred had ventured out into the dating world and had begun a promising relationship with another single parent, a down-to-earth woman named Charlene. 
As for Piper, she had begun dating soon after returning to Texas, where she now lived in Houston, very close to her sister Tina. Piper had her own small law practice, but made most of her income doing research into land titles. It was steady work that did not require a law degree, and it paid well enough that she had been able to afford a house of her own, a new Black Liberty Jeep, and a lifestyle that seemed comfortable and secure. Even though Piper was often behind on child support, Fred was accommodating about any plans Piper could make to see their kids. In fact, just a few weeks earlier, Piper had come east and taken all three kids on a long weekend camping trip in one of Virginia's beautiful national forests. And even though her in-person visits with the kids were not as long or as many as Piper wanted, it wasn't unusual for her to call the kids more than once a day. Maybe, Fred thought as he gave Jocelyn a nudge back to show her he was paying attention again, maybe he and Piper both were ready to practice mercy and humility. Back at the Jablin house on Hearthglow Lane, Fred pulled into the driveway of the detached two-car garage. A moment later, the children piled out of the Ford Explorer and made their way inside the handsome brick and wood two-story house set on a slight rise and surrounded by stately trees. Halloween had always been Fred's favorite holiday, and he and the kids had bagged up most of the fallen leaves and stuffed them into leaf bags that were the shape and color of carved orange pumpkins. Throughout the quiet and affluent subdivision, with its neat green and white welcome sign that read Kingsley, homemade scarecrows and ghosts made out of white sheets watched over the comfortable homes, all set back from the road, some with living rooms and kitchen lights shining through the windows. Once inside 1515 Hearthglow Lane, Fred wasted no time shepherding the three children off to bed. It was around 10 p.m. when he had said his final goodnight and headed back downstairs to clean up and give Charlene a call before heading to bed himself. By the time Fred had switched off his bedside light and settled down to sleep, the painful memories of the past had been replaced with a sense of pleasant anticipation for the weekend ahead. Tomorrow was Saturday, and while the children slept in, Fred would enjoy his coffee and newspaper, and after that, all four of them would have a busy day going to the annual Neighborhood Pumpkin Festival, spending time together and with friends, and putting the finishing touches on their costumes. And on Sunday, they would all enjoy the kind of safe scares that came with going door-to-door trick-or-treating. At 6.37 a.m. the next morning, Fred Jablin's next-door neighbors awoke from a deep sleep to the sudden sound of three gunshots. Getting out of bed and stepping to the open window, former Marine Bob McCardle pushed aside the curtain and saw a shadowy figure running across his front yard and then disappearing into neighboring house lots. While dogs began barking and other neighbors were wondering if a car had backfired or if a hunter was shooting ducks down on Tuckahoe Creek, Bob immediately picked up the phone and called 911. Within minutes of the call, three officers from Henrico County Police Department were climbing out of the patrol car in front of the McArdle home. Spreading out across the lawns of Hearthglow Lane, they used flashlights to search in the darkness for the source of the disturbance. But after 20 minutes, the officers reported back to Bob that they had not found anything suspicious. Bob told them that once it was light, he and his wife would take their dog out for a walk, and if they saw anything that could explain the shots, they would follow up with another call to police. 25 minutes later, it was Doreen McArdle who called 911. Trying her best to keep the panic out of her voice, she explained to dispatch that she, her husband Bob, and their dog were now standing outside of their neighbor's house at 1515 Hearthglow Lane, and Bob had just discovered the body of Fred Jablin. The single dad and prominent Richmond University professor was lying in his driveway alongside the family car, his body stretched out on a thin carpet of blood-soaked leaves. This time, Henrico police responded with a flood of emergency and medical personnel, and within minutes, the quiet neighborhood was alive with flashing lights and sirens. But their response was too late. Fred Jablin was dead. Even as officers strung yellow crime scene tape around the half-acre lot of the Jablin home, a SWAT team had entered the house to make sure the murderer was not inside and, if necessary, to rescue the three sleeping children. But the house was empty except for Fred's kids. As Jocelyn was escorted out the back door so she would not see her father's body lying in the driveway, the 15-year-old turned to the police officer at her side and she asked him to please make sure her brother, sister, and father got out. <laughs> 
By 8.30 a.m. that Saturday morning, Henrico County homicide investigator Kobe Kelly had arrived on the scene and pushed the investigation into high gear. A four-year veteran of the police force, the six-foot, two-inch tall detective, was just 32 years old, but he had a well-deserved reputation for professionalism and for getting results. The Roundtree Jablin children were quickly sheltered at the home of a local police officer who knew the Jablins and lived in the same area. A special victims unit was on its way to help break the terrible news of their father's death and to find out what the children may have heard or seen that morning. Detective Kelly's initial examination of both the outside crime scene and the inside of the house showed no evidence that this had been a robbery gone wrong. There was no sign that anything had been taken. And unfortunately, the neighbor who had made the 911 call to police after hearing gunshots and seeing a figure run across his front lawn could not even identify whether that person had been a man or a woman. Hopefully, the crime scene techs, who were already there collecting any physical evidence and dusting for fingerprints, would be able to provide more information. But at first glance, it looked to Kelly like this had been a premeditated crime, planned by someone who must have known Fred Jablin's morning routine well enough to be lying in wait for him when he stepped outside in the dark that morning to pick up the newspaper that had been tossed onto his driveway. But even before Kelly heard back from the officers he'd sent out to knock on doors and collect information and search for the murder weapon, Kelly knew that there would be plenty of suspects in this case. The victim had been a high-profile college professor with a reputation for working closely with students, any one of whom might have harbored a grudge related to perhaps a failed thesis or maybe a bad grade. With that in mind, Detective Kelly also sent a team out to the University of Richmond, six miles east, to treat Fred's personal office as a crime scene and to interview faculty and students. The detective also started the process of obtaining search warrants, putting in a subpoena for any relevant phone records. But even as the investigator watched a crime scene tech carefully bag a copper-jacketed hollow-point bullet they'd found to the right of the body, Detective Kelly already had the name of the person he was most interested in talking to. In any homicide investigation, the most likely suspects are those with the closest and most intense relationships to the victim. And even though Fred Jablin's ex-wife, Piper Roundtree, lived 1,200 miles to the west in Houston, Texas, she was still number one on Detective Kelly's suspect list, especially when he heard from the first officers on the scene that Fred and Piper had gone through a very messy divorce just two years earlier, and that custody of the three kids was still an ongoing issue. By 10 a.m. that morning, the oldest of the Roundtree Jablin children had told police that she had heard a gunshot early that morning but had gone back to sleep. The younger two kids both told police that they had each had separate phone conversations with their mom the afternoon and evening before. She told them she was calling from Galveston, Texas, where she was researching a land title. She'd also told 12-year-old Paxton about a raccoon that was living under the porch of her house. Knowing that the first 48 hours of any investigation are often the most crucial, Detective Kelly was determined to check out every possible lead. And even though Piper had told her children she had called last night from Texas, Detective Kelly still ordered investigators to check for any passengers named Piper Roundtree who may have flown into Richmond from Houston, Texas over the last several days. By 2.30 p.m., Michael Jablin had been informed of his brother's death, and he and his wife were in their car traveling south to Richmond. And by 3.30 p.m., just eight hours after the McCardles had discovered Fred's body and made their second 911 call, Detective Kelly had already caught a major break in the investigation. His investigators had in fact discovered that a passenger by the name of Roundtree had flown out of Virginia's Norfolk Airport just three hours earlier on a Southwest Airlines flight that was due to arrive back in Houston's Hobby Airport at 4.30 Houston time, which meant 5.30 Virginia time. But there was one problem. The passenger's first name was not Piper. Instead, it was a name Detective Kelly had not yet heard, Tina. Detective Kelly had already found a good picture of Piper Roundtree in one of her children's bedrooms, and the driver's license picture on file for the plane ticket his investigators had discovered was definitely a different person. Instead of dark brown hair, Tina Roundtree had shoulder-length blonde hair. 
Glancing at his watch and seeing he had two hours before the plane carrying Tina Roundtree was due to arrive at Hobby Airport in Houston, Detective Kelly rolled into action. Contacting police in Houston, he sent them pictures of both Piper and Tina Roundtree and asked them if they would go to Hobby Airport in time to locate a passenger getting off that Southwest Airlines flight who looked like either of the two women. But it would turn out that Detective Kelly was now in for a series of disappointments. Whoever that passenger named Tina Roundtree was, she had managed to disembark, collect her checked bags, and apparently leave the airport in Houston without being intercepted or recognized by Houston police. And when Officer Kelly finally reached Piper Roundtree by phone in Houston that night at 9 p.m., 14 hours after Fred had been declared dead, it would turn out that Piper Roundtree would have a rock-solid alibi for the time of the murder. And after being informed by a friend in Richmond about Fred's murder that morning, the only thing Piper wanted to talk about now was where her children were, who was taking care of them, and how they were coping with this devastating news. By now, Detective Kelly had also been filled in on the identity of Tina Roundtree, Piper's older sister, who also lived in Houston. Realizing that he would need to conduct this investigation in two different states, Detective Kelly and his partner headed to Houston to interview the Roundtree sisters. Before leaving, the lead investigator assigned Detective Chuck Hanna and one other investigator to follow up on leads in Richmond. At Detective Kelly's first official interview with Piper on Sunday, October 31st, Fred's ex-wife denied any involvement in Fred's murder. And not only would a friend of hers, who was also a lawyer, place Piper in his office before that Southwest flight ever arrived back in Houston on Saturday, October 30th, the day Fred was killed, Piper would also be able to locate someone who could provide further confirmation of her alibi, a stranger who had seen her at a local bar in Houston on Friday night, when the passenger flying under the name Tina Roundtree had already landed 1,200 miles away in Richmond, Virginia. As for Piper's sister, Tina Roundtree, where Piper had reacted to the news of Fred's death by wanting to talk about when she could see her kids again, Tina had reacted to the news by being aggressive in her criticism of Fred. She held nothing back when it came to listing his faults as a father, a husband, and a human being. But even though the hatred Tina expressed was strong enough to constitute a possible motive for Fred's murder, Tina, who had been seen at her health clinic over the weekend, also had an alibi for the Friday night before Fred's murder and the Saturday morning when he was found dead by his neighbors. And both sisters pointed to alternative suspects that were much closer to 1515 Hearthglow Lane than Texas was. First on that list was Michael Jablin, the brother who stood to gain control of Fred's financial assets. And what about Fred's latest love interest? Had police interviewed Charlene yet? And finally, without providing any names, Piper also hinted darkly at enemies Fred had within the University of Richmond. And when Virginia investigators dug deeper into the money trail behind the passenger tickets belonging to the still unidentified person who traveled under the name Tina Roundtree, the case only got more confusing. The airplane tickets had been purchased by Piper's former boyfriend on a credit card he said he hadn't used in weeks and had assumed was lost. And when investigators in Richmond found a reservation under the name Tina Roundtree at a motel in Richmond for the night before Fred's murder, the name of the person who actually checked into that room showed up in the motel records as Geraldine Smith. And drifting in the background behind the Roundtree sisters, there was Tina's on-again, off-again boyfriend, who had recently taken Piper off to a shooting range for some target practice. Meanwhile, both Piper and her sister Tina started ducking out on any more interviews with law enforcement. Instead, the two sisters checked into the expensive and stylish Houstonian Hotel in central Houston. The only thing Piper seemed to care about now was arranging a court hearing in Virginia to get custody of her three kids. And Tina, who had appointed herself as Piper's guardian and champion, was there to support Piper and keep the press and police at bay. So despite a promising start, three days after the Virginia police had arrived in Houston, Texas, progress into Fred Jablin's murder came to a stuttering halt. And even though detectives in Richmond had turned up some promising evidence, 
What police needed was someone who could positively identify the airline passenger who went by the name Tina Roundtree and then place that person in Richmond at the time of Fred's murder. And on Wednesday, November 3rd, five days after Fred Jablin was killed, police finally got the tip they needed to break the case. Based on an interview with a Southwest Airlines ticketing agent and the deconstruction of hundreds of cell phone calls placed during the days before and after Fred Jablin's death, here is a reconstruction of what happened outside of 1515 Hearthglow Lane on the morning of Saturday, October 30th, 2004. Anyone who knew Frederick Mark Jablin also knew he was a man who enjoyed his routines, especially after all the disruptions of the last two years. He found new meaning in simple pleasures, like getting up at the same time every morning, retrieving his newspaper from the side driveway, then enjoying a freshly brewed pot of coffee in his quiet kitchen. And on this Saturday, when Fred stepped outside dressed in his navy blue sweatpants, sweatshirt, and robe, he also enjoyed knowing that he and the kids could spend the day together, getting ready for Halloween. When he and Piper were together, it had been Fred who took the family pictures, even though it meant that he himself was rarely in any of them. This year, he would make sure to have his neighbors take pictures of him and the three kids. It had been a long haul getting through the divorce, but despite the painful memories that had preoccupied him last night during the Friday evening service at Temple Beth Ahaba, the fact was that Fred felt pretty good about his life and about his kids. He and Piper might not see eye to eye, and Fred doubted he'd ever fully trust his ex-wife again, but he knew she loved their kids as deeply as he did. As Fred headed slowly for the driveway, he could see the tall trees that ringed the big backyard and feel the chill air on his face and ankles. This time tomorrow, daylight savings time would come to an end and clocks would have been set back an hour. Instead of darkness, he'd be watching the sun rise. Still, he liked this feeling of being all alone, the only person awake and outside. Except that Fred was not alone. Standing quietly in the shadow on the far side of the garage, Fred's killer had felt their pulse quicken at the sound of the back door opening and then closing softly behind Fred. Now, the killer heard the slight rustle of leaves as Fred turned right out of the back kitchen door and began walking towards the open space between the house and the garage, which was set back even farther from the street than the house was. The newspaper lay neatly folded on the far side of the black Ford Explorer that was parked near the top of the driveway. The killer knew Fred would walk between the garage doors and around the front bumper of the vehicle to retrieve the paper. And when Fred did exactly that, the killer would be ready. Now adjusting their blue latex gloves, the killer took a slow, deliberate breath. The killer assumed the children were asleep in the house. But even if they were awake, or if they woke up, and even came down the stairs or looked out the bedroom windows, they wouldn't see anything. The killer would be gone, and Fred's body would be hidden from view by the big black car in the driveway. A moment later, the sound of rustling leaves gave way to the sound of slippers on pavement. But as Fred rounded the front bumper of his Ford Explorer, the garage doors on his left and the children's basketball hoop on the other side of the driveway facing him, he paused for a second before making another quarter turn to his right to scan the ground for the folded newspaper. At that moment, Fred's killer stepped out of their hiding place on the far side of the garage. This shot would not be fired at point-blank range, or even close enough to leave any gunpowder residue on Fred's sweatshirt or robe, but the killer would still hit their target. A moment later, as Fred straightened and began to turn back towards whatever he had just seen out of the corner of his eye, his killer pulled the trigger of the 38 caliber revolver loaded with its copper-jacketed hollow-point bullets. And as the sound of the shots died away, the killer watched as Fred crumpled to the ground. Reaching the pavement, Fred's body rolled so he lay face down but still partly on his side, his glasses landing a foot or so away from his face, his knees drawn up slightly towards his chest. Although neighbors would report hearing three gunshots, only two bullets hit their mark. The second shot entered the soft tissue of Fred's right arm back to front, the bullet traveling downward and missing any vital tissue. That was the bullet that would be recovered at the crime scene in just a few hours. It was the first shot that proved fatal. That type of bullet, designed to mushroom out upon impact so it did maximum internal damage, had entered from the back, striking Fred in the lower right side before ripping upward through his spleen, kidney, liver, diaphragm, and aorta, the main artery carrying blood away from the heart. 
By the time the first dogs in the neighborhood had started to bark, the killer was running across the neighbor's front lawn towards the darker shade of the trees that bordered each house lot. The medical examiner, who would later perform the autopsy on Fred's body, could not rule out the possibility that if Fred had been found immediately after that first 911 call at around 6.37 a.m., he might have survived his injuries. Still, the first medics on the scene an hour later had done everything they could. Despite not finding a pulse, they still turned Fred onto his back and cut away his shirt to inject heart-stimulating drugs and to perform CPR, but they were too late. Sometime between that first 911 call and the second 911 call more than an hour later, Fred had died of organ failure and massive internal bleeding. By the time police had covered Fred's body with a white sheet and escorted his terrified children out of the house, Fred's killer was already on the road making the two-hour drive south to Virginia's Norfolk International Airport. After returning their rented maroon minivan, Fred's killer made their way to the ticketing agent at Southwest Airlines. At 8.29 a.m., two hours after murdering Fred, the killer booked a flight first to Baltimore, 200 miles north, and then on from Baltimore to Houston, Texas. As Piper Roundtree handed the Southwest Airline ticketing agent her sister Tina's ID and the ticket Piper had bought using the credit card that she'd taken from her boyfriend, Jerry Walters, she made a quick adjustment to the blonde wig she was wearing over her dark brown hair, and she also made sure her sunglasses completely covered her brown eyes. A few minutes later, when Piper sat down in the waiting area until it was time to board her 12.30 a.m. flight back to Houston, she pulled out her cell phone and scrolled through the long list of calls she had made since arriving in Richmond two days earlier, on Thursday, October 28th. She was smart to have asked the receptionist at the motel in Richmond to change her name in the register from Tina Roundtree to Geraldine Smith, just one more way to throw police off her trail. And when the police did come to question her, she could honestly tell them that things with Fred were so much better now than they had been two years ago. But for Piper, her camping vacation earlier in the month with the kids had finally shown her that getting along better with Fred still wasn't enough. The person her children really needed wasn't their father, it was her, their mother. And soon enough, they would have her, and only her. As Piper tucked Tina's driver's license back inside her wallet, Piper looked closely at the small picture of her sister. Tina was a little taller and heavier, her hair was blonde and her eyes were a bright blue, but when Piper wore the wig and dark glasses, all people saw were the similarities in the sisters' faces and expressions and that wide, round tree smile. But it would turn out that Piper's disguise, like her alibi, was not quite as good as she thought it was. Five days after Piper Roundtree killed the father of her three kids, Detective Kelly from Virginia knew that in order to solve this murder investigation, he needed to get a positive ID on Southwest Airlines passenger Tina Roundtree. So, on the afternoon of Wednesday, November 3rd, the same day that hundreds of people were attending Fred Jablin's funeral service back in Richmond, the investigator made one more trip back to Hobby Airport in Houston. He tracked down the name of the Southwest Airline agent who had checked Tina Roundtree's ticket and luggage on her flight from Houston out to Richmond one week earlier on Thursday, October 28th. When he met Kathy Molly, the big detective from Virginia showed her Tina Roundtree's airline ticket and asked Kathy if she could remember anything about the passenger. A moment later, Kathy handed the ticket back with a friendly smile. Yeah, I remember, she told the investigator. Kathy went on to say that the passenger was a very attractive woman, nicely dressed, but there was something else Kathy remembered too. The passenger was obviously wearing a blonde wig, and along with her suitcase, she was carrying a gun. And when Detective Kelly showed Kathy the pictures he now carried with him everywhere, one of Tina Roundtree and one of Piper Roundtree, Kathy didn't even hesitate before tapping the photo of Piper. That's her, Kathy said. That's the woman who checked the gun. On Monday, November 8th, 2004, 10 days after Fred was shot to death outside of his home on Hearthglow Lane, Enrico County Police charged his ex-wife, Piper Roundtree, with first-degree murder. Piper was arrested shortly after leaving a custody hearing in Virginia, at which Piper asked the court to grant her, and not Fred's brother Michael, custody of the three Roundtree Jablin children. In addition to having been identified as the passenger traveling to and from Richmond under the name Tina Roundtree, 
Piper's cell phone records had also placed her in and around Richmond from Thursday, October 28th through the morning of Saturday, October 30th, the morning of Fred's death. Even though Piper claimed that she and her sister Tina often used one another's cell phones, the phone that Piper used on Friday evening, the night before Fred was killed, to call her son Paxton and tell him she was in Texas, was the same cell phone that had pinged off cell phone towers in Richmond to connect that call to Paxton's cell phone. As for Piper's alibis, it would turn out that after checking credit card receipts, the man who had placed Piper in the Volcano Bar in Houston on that Friday night before Fred's murder had made a mistake. It had been Saturday night after Piper had returned from Richmond that she was seen at that bar. And although Piper's friend and former law colleague would insist to Virginia investigators that he had talked to Piper in Houston midday on Saturday before that Southwest flight from Baltimore arrived in Houston, it turned out that he had made an earlier statement to a reporter saying that the first time he had seen Piper in nearly a year was the day after Fred's murder, Sunday, October 31st, when she would have already been back in Houston for nearly 24 hours. On Saturday, February 26, 2005, one year and four months after Fred was murdered, a Virginia jury spent less than one hour in deliberations before coming back with a guilty verdict in the trial of Piper Roundtree. Her defense attorney argued unsuccessfully that the real murderer was Piper's sister, Tina, and when Piper herself took the stand, she implied the same thing while at the same time insisting to the end that she herself had absolutely nothing to do with Fred's murder. When asked point blank if she wanted the jury to think her sister, Tina, committed the murder, Piper replied, I have no idea what happened. Piper would use that same refrain when she was asked how her cell phone had appeared in Virginia in the days before and on the day of Fred's murder, or why she decided to brush up on her shooting skills the week before Fred's death, or why she had used her boyfriend's credit card to purchase a blonde wig, or how her Black Liberty Jeep had wound up in the parking lot at the Hobby Airport in Houston from Thursday, October 28th to Saturday, October 30th, Piper told the jury she either had no idea how those things could have happened, or that they were just meaningless coincidences that had nothing to do with Fred's murder. Two and a half months later, on May 7th, 2005, Piper was sentenced to life in prison. Her first request for parole in 2020 was denied. She will be eligible for parole again in 2033, when she will be 72 years old. On Friday, November 4, 2005, days before Piper's trial for murder, Piper's sister, Tina, pled guilty in a Houston courtroom to a charge related to Fred Joplin's murder, attempted tampering of evidence. Tina was fined $300 and sentenced to 80 hours of community service. Tina died in 2020. In 2006, a Virginia court granted full custody of Fred and Piper's three children to Fred's brother, Michael Jablin. We'd like to say a special thanks to author Catherine Casey, whose book, Die, My Love, A True Story of Revenge, Murder, and Two Texas Sisters, was our main source in creating this podcast. Because Piper Roundtree has never admitted any guilt or involvement in the murder of Fred Jablin, we relied on the prosecution's evidence and theory of motive to create our reconstruction of this crime. If you're interested in finding out more, please see our source list for additional background and information. In the spring of 2017, Antonio Navarrete was on top of the world. Just a year earlier, the 21-year-old Florida resident had met the love of his life a young woman named Daisy Martinez. And now Daisy was pregnant, and so she and Antonio were very excited about starting a family together. For the time being, Antonio and Daisy were living with Antonio's parents in his hometown of Waimama, which is a quiet rural suburb just south of Tampa. But Antonio had a bright future ahead of him. Ever since he had graduated high school, he knew what he wanted to do with his life. He wanted to be an auto mechanic, and he had the skills to do it. From the time he was a toddler, he had always been obsessed with cars, breaking apart his toy cars and putting them back together. And then as he got a little bit older, he began drawing these very intricate drawings of cars that he loved or designs for new cars. And then when he was a teenager, he began actually tinkering around with real cars until he finally acquired a car of his own. It was a white Chevy low rider pickup truck that he tricked out with all these fancy lights and special rims and this huge sound system that took up most of his back seat. 
It was thanks in part to this truck, which he nicknamed Casper, that Antonio, who was too shy to be much of a ladies' man, met up with Daisy in the first place. Antonio had driven Casper to a local car meetup for other car enthusiasts, where you could basically park your vehicle and you could walk around and see what other people did to upgrade or enhance their vehicles. And so while Antonio was there, he was walking around when he saw on the far side of this meetup, there was this unbelievably beautiful young woman, and he found himself just staring at her. He couldn't help it. And this young woman, who was Daisy, she eventually would look up and she would smile at him, and the rest, as they say, was history. Six months later, not long after Daisy had moved in with Antonio at his parents' house, and the couple had announced to their delighted families that they were going to have a baby, Antonio got yet another good piece of news. He'd landed a good job with a company that did maintenance work for Tampa Electric Company's Big Bend Power Plant, which was located in Apollo, Florida, which was about 10 miles to the east of Antonio's parents' home. Now, this was not Antonio's dream job. He still very much wanted to eventually become an auto mechanic, but this job paid 12 bucks an hour, nearly double what he was used to making. And so with this job, he and Daisy would finally be able to raise enough money to get a place of their own, hopefully before the baby arrived that fall. Also, Antonio had been told by other people who worked at this company that this was actually a really easy job, that pretty much you just rolled around on golf carts all day picking up trash. It was perfect. A few weeks later, on June 24th, Antonio found himself driving in his truck to the Big Bend power plant for his first day on the job. As he drove, he would have glanced over at the picture of Daisy he had taped to his dashboard. She was the only woman he had ever loved besides his mother. When Antonio arrived at the Big Bend power plant, he was totally amazed at just how enormous this thing was. It was basically this huge factory that sat right up against the water, and there were four huge smokestacks coming out of the ceiling of this factory with white smoke billowing out of them. This plant produced electricity, and they did this by burning coal. This process was done in four distinct units that were inside of this factory that Antonio was looking at. And each of these units is comprised of a humongous boiler, which is basically a 12-story tall oven. And so coal is loaded into this huge boiler, and it burns at the bottom of the boiler, creating some steam. And that steam goes up the boiler and begins to turn these huge turbines, creating the electricity. And then the steam just continues up the boiler and then out its respective smokestack into the air. In newer units, the airborne ash, which is a natural byproduct of burning coal, is captured inside of the boiler. But at Big Bend, three of their four units were built in the 1970s, so they were older models, and they did not capture the airborne ash inside the boilers. Instead, the ash would get heated up so much that it would melt and turn into a substance called slag which basically is molten lava, like the stuff that comes out of volcanoes. That's what slag is. And so as the slag kind of builds up inside of the boiler, it would go through this man-sized hole at the very bottom of the boiler. And right below that hole is this 30-foot tall water tank called a cooling tank. And this red-hot slag, it basically dumps down into that water, which cools it off turning it into these kind of glassy rocks. And then they settle at the bottom of this 30-foot cooling tank, and at the bottom of the cooling tank is this grinding mechanism that pulls these hardened, cooled-off little boulders of slag into it, and it crushes them up and spits them out on the other side as little tiny bits of slag chips. And then these chips get sold for use in everything from sandpaper to roofing shingles. So after Antonio had spent several minutes just admiring this gargantuan building he would be working in, he gathered up his things, he hopped out of his truck, and he headed toward the front doors. That day, and the next couple of days, were very uneventful for Antonio. He basically just sat in a break room and watched videos about safety and training, and then when he wasn't doing that, he was out trying to navigate around the inside of this huge factory, which was basically this huge maze, and he found very quickly that it was a very hazardous place to work, as there were huge trucks moving around inside of it, it was super loud, and there was just heavy machinery operating constantly all around you. But after several days of just kind of walking around and asking people what things were, Antonio felt like he had a pretty good handle on the layout and also on what his job would entail. 
On Thursday, June 29th, so just four days into doing this new job, Antonio woke up in his parents' house in a really good mood because the next day, that Friday, Daisy was going in for an ultrasound and they were going to find out whether their baby was a boy or a girl. And he was very excited about this. And so Antonio came downstairs, he grabbed a quick bite to eat, and then he kissed Daisy on the cheek, and he headed outside into his truck and began the commute to work. A few hours later, Antonio's mother was in the grocery store when she pulled her phone out of her purse, and she noticed Antonio had called her and she missed it, but he had left a voicemail. And so she played the voicemail and then put the phone to her ear. And what she heard was quite possibly the most traumatic thing a mother could ever hear from their child. After leaving the house that morning, Antonio drove all the way to work, no problem. He parked in the lot, he went inside the building, and initially the day was like any other day. He just kind of drove around the facility and picked up trash, and that was it. But just a couple of hours into his shift, two fairly significant issues arose simultaneously inside of Unit 2. In the boiler, the slag that was building up had somehow created a sort of plug over that man-sized hole where the slag was supposed to dump into the water chamber. And so as more and more slag was being created as the ash melted, it wasn't draining into that chamber, and so all of this slag was just building up on top of itself inside of the boiler. And then in the water chamber, completely unconnected from the issue in the boiler, the slag that had fallen into the water chamber that had cooled and settled at the bottom, it had landed in such a way that it actually blocked the grinding mechanism. And so none of the cooled slag boulders and rocks were being ground up and expelled out the other side. And so they needed to fix these two issues quickly, otherwise Unit 2 would become basically ineffective. Now, the safe way to fix these two blockages would be to start by turning off Unit 2's boiler. And then once it was off, you could drop dynamite into the boiler itself and break up the blockage over the man-sized hole, and you could send a team into the water chamber after you drained it to chip away and move the blockage over the grinding mechanism. However, turning a boiler off at a power plant is extremely expensive. And so the Tampa Electric Company decided, you know what, let's just have them fix these blockages without turning the boiler off. And so at four in the afternoon, a senior plant manager rounded up five other employees, which included Antonio, to come with him and do these repairs inside of Unit 2. And so the plan was to empty all the water from the cooling chamber of Unit 2, and then once it was empty, they would open something called the doghouse door, which is on the outside of the cooling chamber towards the bottom. They would open that up, giving them a line of sight into the bottom of this cooling chamber where that grinding mechanism was, where all those slag rocks had kind of come to a stop on top of it, and they would fire water cannons into the bottom of this cooling chamber to attempt to dislodge these slag rocks off of the grinding mechanism. And then after they cleared that blockage, they would shut the doghouse door and they would somehow deal with the blockage inside of the boiler. But that felt like a secondary issue. They needed to make sure the grinding mechanism was cleared before they did anything else. Now, you need to understand that this company had asked their employees to do this type of repair before, to do it with the boiler still on, and in the past, nothing bad had ever happened, and so these six guys, including Antonio, must have thought this was just totally routine, that we would never be asked to do something like this if it was extremely hazardous. But it would turn out, what they were doing, making these repairs with the boiler still on, was quite possibly the most hazardous thing they could possibly do at this plant. But either way, the six-man team made their way over to Unit 2, and they began taking up positions with their water cannons right in front of the doghouse door. Antonio's job for this operation was actually not to be involved in getting the slag free. He was just going to be there to clean up during and after the operation. And so he stood kind of in front of the doghouse door, but maybe 10 or 15 feet back, just kind of standing back, watching the other guys do their jobs. Now, you need to understand the scale of the machinery in front of Antonio and these other men. You have the water chamber, which is 30 feet tall, and then above the water chamber is the 12-story tall boiler that is still on. So there's coal actively burning inside of it. There's red-hot slag, so like lava, just kind of tumbling around inside of it. 
and the steam inside of this boiler is well over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. And so they are dwarfed by this totally dangerous piece of machinery. But eventually, their operation begins. The senior plant manager has the water chamber drained, and then after it's empty, they open the doghouse door, and Antonio watched as the other five men took turns with their water cannons, firing them through this door at the big slag rocks that are sitting on top of the grinding mechanism. And it wasn't really working that well, but they were starting to make some progress. And Antonio likely was just kind of getting bored waiting for this to be over because there really wasn't much for him to do. There wasn't much cleanup. And then as he's standing there, something horrible happened. Because the boiler had been left on, all that ash was still getting melted and turned into slag. And the slag was not being drained because that plug had formed over the man-sized hole in the boiler. And so you have all the slag that's building up, building up, it's getting heavier and heavier and heavier. And about 20 minutes into their cleanup operation, the weight of all that slag broke through that plug, immediately creating an opening where all this red hot slag, this lava came tumbling down. It rebounded on the back end of the empty water tank and shot out of the doghouse door like a tidal wave of hellfire. And in seconds, thousands of gallons of this lava-like substance was all over all six men. It was like a wave going over them. And then after the slag hits the ground, they were all standing in six inches of basically lava that stretched in 40 feet in any direction. Now, unlike trying to run in, let's say, mud or deep water where you're just kind of moving slowly, every step you take in this slag, basically your foot melts into the slag. So with every step, your shoe melts, then your skin melts, then your bones melt into this substance. And so all these men, after immediately being hit with this stuff and catching on fire, literally, they likely tried to start running, but it was like their bodies were slowly consumed by this slag feet first. And so Antonio tried to run like the rest of them, but he couldn't go anywhere and he fell onto the slag. So he's laying on his side, and as he's melting and burning to death, he reaches into his pants pocket with his free hand and he pulls his phone out and he calls his mother. She doesn't pick up and so he leaves her a voicemail and all he says is, mom, mom, I'm burning, please call the cops, please, mom. And in the background of this voicemail, all you hear is the hissing sound of the steam and slag pouring out of the boiler. In total, five of the six men that were a part of this repair operation would be killed from this tidal wave of slag. Antonio would be one of them. Tampa Electric would end up paying out a settlement to each of the families of the deceased. On the morning of August 12, 2000, 33 of Russia's best naval warships stopped inside of a particular section of the Barents Sea. The Barents Sea is this 800-mile stretch of freezing water up in the Arctic Circle, just northwest of Russia, and these 33 ships were in this stretch of water for this huge military training exercise. Basically, they were going to run through some war game scenarios, where, for example, one ship would pretend to be an enemy combatant, and the other ships would work on locking onto that ship and firing at them. But of course, they wouldn't use real missiles or torpedoes, they would use duds that didn't actually explode. And so around 9 a.m., the man who was in charge of this entire operation, his name was Admiral Popov, and he was actually on board one of these 33 ships. He authorized one of the submarines that was out there to shoot two of their dummy torpedoes at a target, an enemy combatant, which was actually just one of the other ships. And so as soon as he did this, he was authorizing the start of this multi-day long exercise. And so all day and all night, they're doing these war game scenarios. And by the following morning, so 24 hours into this exercise, Admiral Popov stepped away from the action to speak with Russian reporters on the phone. And during this interview, he tells them that so far, the training exercise is going exactly to plan and that it looks like it will ultimately be a huge success. However, there was a problem. At the same time, Admiral Popov is giving his remarks to the reporters about how well this exercise is going. The family members of some of the crews that were out there as part of this exercise, they heard a rumor that the exercise was not going to plan, that in fact, something bad had happened to one of the ships. But none of the family members had any more information beyond that. Even though this rumor was just that, a rumor, the family members of these crews that are participating in this exercise, they naturally became very worried. 
And so they all that morning began calling the naval base where the 33 ships had originated, asking for more information. And the phone operator on the base that was receiving all of these calls that morning at first was telling these family members that, no, nothing's going on. I haven't heard anything. There's no issues. But eventually, this phone operator let slip that, in fact, they too had heard the rumor that something bad had happened. And they think it actually might be true. But when this family member who heard this pressured the phone operator for more information, the operator clammed up and said, you know, I can't give you anything else. And so at that point, the family member hung up the phone and called the media and told them what was going on. And the media, as soon as they had the story, they went right to Admiral Popov and they said, hey, can you address this rumor? And he didn't. He did not respond to any of the media's inquiries. And in a weird way, that was kind of reassuring to the family members of these crews because they're thinking, you know, if Admiral Popov is just kind of ignoring this rumor and he's staying out there out on the Barents Sea still conducting this exercise, then certainly nothing bad could have happened, right? And so for the rest of that day, Sunday, the family members of these crews and the media just kind of did nothing because there wasn't anything else to do besides wait to see if there was any new news coming out of this exercise. And the following day, on Monday the 14th, so 48 hours after the start of this training exercise, there would be news. Russian officials would go on TV and they would address the rumor by saying, well, yeah, it is true. Something did happen out during this exercise. The Kursk, which was the name of one of the submarines that was one of the 33 ships that was part of this exercise, they experienced some minor technical difficulties that forced them to ground their vessel at the bottom of the Barents Sea. But don't worry, this is normal. We're in touch with them through the radio. Everybody is fine. We are pumping air and power into their submarine and before long, we will have them back on the surface. There's nothing to worry about. Now, naturally, the family members of the Kursk crew specifically, they panicked when they heard this because even though the government is acting totally confident that everything is fine, they did not feel confident that everything was fine. Their family members are trapped on the bottom of the ocean. But at the same time, they remembered the Kursk, the actual submarine, was a very special and very safe submarine. The Kursk was quite literally Russia's best ship. They had spared no expense on it. It was extremely expensive and it was massive. It was bigger than two football fields put together. And it was constructed out of this very specialized, highly reinforced steel that allowed it to take a direct hit from a torpedo and just keep on going, no problem. It was also outfitted on the inside with all the latest and greatest technology. And so if you were going to be stuck at the bottom of the ocean inside of a submarine, you would want to be stuck inside of the Kursk. And so the families took solace in that. But over the next couple of days, despite the government reassuring everybody in the news that everything was fine, it's totally minor, we're going to have the Kursk up in no time, despite all that, the Kursk still had not been raised to the surface. And the government was not giving the families or the media any new information. And so in this kind of void of no real information, the families began to panic and the media began to speculate. Did the Kursk really suffer from minor technical difficulties like the government was saying? Or was this something more serious? This question would be answered on August 21st, so nine days after this training exercise had begun, when a Norwegian dive team, they were out there to assist in the recovery effort, they were able to dive down to the Kursk and they actually got inside of the submarine through an escape hatch. An escape hatch is like this watertight closet that kind of sits on the outside of the submarine and it allows people to go in and out of the submarine without flooding it. And once these Norwegian divers got inside of the Kursk and had a look around, they were totally shocked at what they saw. While the exact details of what happened inside the Kursk are still debated today and probably will be for some time, there is one aspect of the story that is more or less universally accepted. And that is what happened inside of compartment number nine. The Kursk was divided into nine watertight segments called compartments. Number one was at the front of the submarine, and then it went two, three, four, all the way down to nine in the very back of the submarine. And the reason we know what happened inside of compartment number nine is because a 27-year-old Kursk crew member, Dmitry Kolesnikov, told us. 
Dimitri was born into a family of submariners. His father was a submariner, and his father's father was a submariner, and Dimitri idolized them, and so growing up, that was all he ever wanted to be. And in the late 1990s, his dream would become a reality when he commissioned as a naval officer in the Russian Navy and was given orders to serve on board the Kursk. Four months before this training exercise out in the Barents Sea, Dimitri met and very quickly married a high school teacher named Olga, and right after their wedding, one of the first things he did is he brought her on board the Kursk for a tour. And Olga brought along a video camera and filmed her tour through the ship. And on this video, Dimitri is all smiles. He is so happy to be leading her around the ship and introducing her to people and showing her all the cramped spaces on board the submarine. It's really obvious that Dimitri was so proud of his job. Not only of his job, but also just so proud to be sharing this part of his life with his wife. Fast forward to August 12th, 2000, and Dimitri, along with 117 other crew members on board the Kursk, had just arrived at their designated section in the Barents Sea for this training exercise. And at 11.27 a.m., the captain of the Kursk came over the radio and he told Admiral Popov, who was not on the Kursk, he was on a separate ship, he told the Admiral that the Kursk was about to fire their two dummy torpedoes. After this call was made, the men in the first compartment of the Kursk, so at the very front of the Kursk, this is where all the torpedoes, both fake and real, are stored, they began loading these two dummy torpedoes. Meanwhile, Dimitri was all the way back in the seventh compartment, the engine room. That was where he was stationed. He was actually in charge of everybody who worked in the seventh compartment. And so as these two dummy torpedoes are being loaded, Dimitri and his men, there weren't that many of them, they were twisting dials and pulling levers, when all of a the sudden there's this really loud crashing sound, and then the ship shudders and then jolts hard to one side, as if someone had grabbed the front of the submarine and just forced it to one direction. What Dimitri and the men in the seventh compartment could not have possibly known was that one of the real torpedoes in the first compartment had malfunctioned and it exploded. But because of how well built the Kursk was, how strong the exterior walls were, this torpedo, as advertised, did not puncture through it. It did a lot of damage and caused a massive fire, but the sub was not sinking. So back in the seventh compartment, Dimitri, he stands up from being jostled to the ground and the alarms are going off and everything is totally chaotic. Everyone's asking what's going on. And Dimitri, he takes charge and he tells his men to follow the emergency protocol, which was to seal the watertight doors of your compartment. And so in this case, he sealed both the doors, one leading to the sixth compartment and the other leading to the eighth compartment. There's a lot of reasons for why they do this, but in essence, if there's a leak somewhere in the submarine, by sealing off your compartment, you protect yourself from being flooded. As Dimitri and his men are sealing these two doors, they would have begun to see and smell smoke as it came in through the ventilation ducts because there was now this uncontrolled fire raging at the front of the submarine. They also would have felt the submarine suddenly pitch upward at a very steep angle as the captain of the Kursk desperately tried to surface. But before they could reach the surface, that uncontained fire reached the other live torpedoes and it set off this almost instantaneous chain reaction of explosions. This second collective blast killed virtually everyone in the front half of the submarine. Either the blast itself blew them apart or once this hole in the front of the submarine, because the second blast did puncture the walls, once that hole was created, all this Arctic water began flooding into the submarine. So if you didn't get killed by the blast, you very quickly drowned. The only people who survived the first and second explosions were anyone in the sixth compartment going backwards. So six, seven, eight, and nine. And so Dimitri and the other men in the seventh compartment they would have been definitely badly shaken up from that second explosion. That completely rocked the submarine and sent them tumbling all over the place, but they would have been very alive and very aware of the terrible situation they were in. And so I would imagine that Dimitri and the others tried to grab onto any of the piping or anything they could as the submarine, because the control tower has been destroyed, just angled straight down and began careening downward. At 11.32 a.m., just four minutes after that initial explosion, the Kursk slammed nose first into the ocean floor 350 feet below the surface, and then the back half of the Kursk came down to rest. 
we don't know exactly what happened on board the Kursk for those first two hours after they hit the ocean floor. What we do know is they had power, so there was light inside of the submarine. Also, the air purifiers were still working, so despite the chemicals and smoke that was in the air, it was relatively easy to breathe. During those first two hours, we also know that at some point, Dimitri and the other men in his compartment must have heard banging coming from the sixth compartment, because remember, they had sealed off the doors both to the eighth and the sixth compartment, and so Dimitri decided to break emergency protocol, and he opened the door to the sixth compartment to allow any of the survivors that were banging on the door to come into their compartment. And when Dimitri and his men opened that door and looked into the sixth compartment, they would have seen that it was rapidly flooding and most likely anybody forward of that compartment, so 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, they were already dead. By 1.30 p.m., Dimitri and his men in the seventh compartment and the other survivors from the sixth compartment, they were forced to retreat from the seventh over to the eighth compartment and then finally into the ninth compartment because of flooding. Even though they had sealed off their watertight doors, the walls were no longer watertight because this huge explosion had sent shrapnel flying down the body of the submarine, puncturing holes in all of the walls. And so it didn't matter if you shut your watertight door, eventually as one compartment would fill up, it would begin leaking through all the cracks in the walls. And so Dimitri and all of the people he was with, they would have been very aware of that. And so by the time they got all the way back to the ninth compartment, the very back compartment, there was nowhere else to go. The water was going to eventually reach them and they were doomed unless they got rescued or if they left out of the escape hatch. Despite how absolutely terrifying this situation must have been, Dimitri remained calm. In fact, he was so calm that he pulled out a piece of paper as he's sitting in this cramped ninth compartment with these 22 other men, and he writes the date and time in the corner, and then he begins to kind of describe what had happened. He talks about there being an explosion, and he thought he and these 22 men were the only survivors, and he says they're now trapped in the ninth compartment, and they have to wait for rescue. He also talks about how they had considered going out the escape hatch, but apparently it hadn't worked. After Dimitri wrote this very neat, very legible, very organized note, he folded it up and put it in his pocket, and then for the next hour and a half, he sat inside of the ninth compartment with the 22 others, and the power went out, which thrust them into absolute pitch darkness. I mean, completely black inside of there, and the temperatures, because the power was out, suddenly began to plummet, and then the worst part was, the water began seeping through the walls. And so Dimitri and the other men, they would have known that it's just a matter of time before this room fills completely with water and there is nowhere to go. And so with the water rising all around them, Dimitri pulls that paper back out of his pocket and he adds to the note. And this time his handwriting is barely legible. And it's because he's probably suffering from hypothermia, so he's shaking. He can't see what he's writing. In fact, he writes the words, I'm writing blind, to indicate it's totally dark in the room. And in this second note, he leaves on this piece of paper, which was dated and timestamped an hour and a half after the first one, Dimitri indicates that he does not think he's going to survive. It's very clear none of them think they're going to survive. Then, with the remaining space on this piece of paper, Dimitri writes this very loving and very thoughtful message to his wife and his family saying goodbye, and then his final words on this note are, regards to everybody, no need to despair, Kolesnikov. After he wrote this second message on this note, he folded the paper up, put it in his breast pocket, and then in total darkness, listening to the sound of water rushing into the room, he and the other 22 damned souls prepared to die. We don't know how long Dimitri and the other 22 men survived in compartment 9, but experts say the entire Kursk submarine was completely flooded eight hours after the initial explosion. One of the most heartbreaking aspects of this case is that Dimitri and these 22 other men could have potentially been saved if the Russian response was a little bit more urgent and coordinated. Despite two of the ships, including the ship that Admiral Popov was on, hearing and feeling the second explosion that the Kursk experienced, nothing was done about it. It was reported, but no one really did anything. 
And then when no one could get in touch with the Kursk after they had said they were going to fire those two dummy torpedoes, everybody else, all the other ships, Admiral Popov, they all just said, you know what, I'm sure it's just their radios and they're fine and they'll be in touch soon. And so it wasn't until later that evening when the Russian Navy even figured out there was a major problem with the Kursk, that the Kursk has vanished. And then it would be several hours before they even got a rescue submersible in the water down to the Kursk. And then once it was down there, they could not latch onto the escape hatch on the submarine. And so even if there were survivors inside of the submarine, they would not have been able to exit into this rescue submersible. And so for days and days, the Russians struggled to try to get inside of the submarine and kept turning down foreign aid from Norway, from America, from Great Britain. And then finally, nine days after the Kursk had sank, the Russians did accept foreign aid. And that's when the Norwegian dive team, they went down and they were able to open up the escape hatch. And when they went inside the submarine, they saw it was completely flooded. There were bodies floating everywhere. And that's when ultimately Dmitry's body was found and they found that note tucked in his breast pocket. Russia would go on to award the entire crew of the Kursk with the Order of Courage, which is a very significant military award. And the families of the crew of the Kursk were given 10 years salary each. They were also given free housing in any Russian city and their children would all have their college education. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please invite the five-star review button to go on a long bike ride with you. But before you leave, replace the water in their water bottles with hot dog water. Also, please subscribe to the Mr. Ballin podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories we have posted on our YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. We now have a registered 501c3 charitable organization called the Mr. Ballin Foundation that makes it as easy as possible for you to join me, my family, and my team in supporting those whose lives have been most impacted by violent and heinous crime. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. But the real reward is helping to create a new ending to the story for victims of violent crime. Go to mrballin.foundation and click Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Lastly, we have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. So, that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, see ya.